Jumping right into Andy Stanley's most recent comments that he made. And this is why uh -huh. Justin and Brian were invited, the two married gay men at the center of all the controversy, oh, and I'm sure that you've read all about. In a message to his church titled, I Love My Church. Boy, I sure hope so. They have more faith than a lot of you. This message was given to his own congregation, and it wasn't even initially streamed live. It wasn't put up until a few days later. Uh, his reasoning for that is because he wanted to speak to his church first. Uh, maybe he just wanted to see how controversial the message would be. <laughs> In which case, it's probably not something he should have gone public with. But he had two gay, quote, married men speak. So here's the latest video from Andy. We'll let him speak to you in his own words. So thanks um, for being here. And for those of you at all of our Atlanta area churches, and I think we have about 12 churches joining us live today. Thanks. Um, thanks for being there. Um, and I haven't greeted everybody at North Point. So for those of you at other churches, give me just a second. If this is your first time with us, um, you came at a very unique, interesting time. In fact, you're about to learn some things about our church that will make you love us more or decide, you know, I don't think that's church for me. So it's the, really, it's the perfect time to be here and you're so welcome to be here. And doesn't this already sound bad, Don? The way, <laughs> like it's, it's almost like when you have to have to give a disclaimer when you're getting into yeah, it. This know. may be your last time at church. Like it's probably not going to be that great. I what assure you, you if you come say? back next week, it won't be this crowded. In fact, it may Wouldn't never be, be this crowded again. <laughs> But I, I'm actually, I mean, I, I keep getting p people praying for me today, which I'm so grateful, but I'm honestly genuinely excited because I love our church and I love to brag about our church. And really today is just an opportunity that I have hoped I'd have eventually, it came sooner than I thought, to just tell you about some things about your church that you've been up to that you didn't know about, not because they were secret, but because your lives just didn't necessarily um, interface with some of these amazing environments. Now, now, you know what? Uh, I feel like this is just totally opposite of, of uh, what he usually says, because th there's a clip that I, I play from time to time mm -hmm. of him saying how courageous the uh, gay community is for attending church. They have more faith than a lot of you. All right. And how uh, church people are, are so bad because we've abused them so much. After the way the church has treated the gay community? You know, so it's a, I almost feel like sometimes, like, you know, it's almost like you could make the thumbnail, like, Andy Stanley hates the church. He hates you. He hates his church. But now he's coming out with this, um, you know, this message, I love my church. Does that... Uh, that strike you kind of funny like it does me? Um, that said, this is not an emotionally neutral topic. So out of sensitivity for the people around you, and this is for everybody at all of our churches, if you would, if you would please hold your booze and your applause. And hold I put booze. this up here because what? if you say hold your booze, that can mean... He, he's expecting booze. <laughs> he's unbelievable. I mean, as a, as a preacher, like, I, I just... Why are you why are you doing this to your church? I see it's like he's like, I love my church, but my church is gonna boo me. I I hate my church. It's like I, I feel like I feel like by doing this, this the, the message, the actions speak much louder than than the words. And I, I think the actions are I hate different things to different people. <clears throat> so I mean like this kind of booze. So hold your booze and your applause, unless you're at home, hold anything you want, but I, hold your booze and your applause. And I don't mean hold them to the end. I mean, just, you know, just hold. I, I should say just for a little bit of background on this, this came on the heels of what was a pretty trying, I guess, you know, few days for him. Uh, that was probably why he gave this message because he was getting such significant pushback from the commission, from the Christian community about uh, what Hold him. And, um, and this, I, I, I didn't know if I should say this or not, but for those of you who are like super enthusiastic Christians, like you just preach along with me. And, and you're not. <laughs> no, he's trying to fit in with the rest of the world. What? Super enthusiastic. Yeah. Preach Christian. it get them sick them. Go Andy. You know, and, mm -hmm, and I understand that I grew up in that tradition. If you could dial that back a little bit, really out I of sensitivity to some tradition. people around you. But um, who may be now. processing some of the things I'm going to talk about for the first time in their whole life and may um, just disagree. So if, if, you, if we could just be sensitive today, that would be, um, let's jump in. On September the 18th, which is just a couple of weeks ago, a prominent leader um, in the Southern Baptist Convention published uh, this article. Uh, so some of you have seen this. Uh, the train is leaving the station. Andy Stanley's departure from biblical uh, Christianity. 
Um, the, the focus of the article, for those of you who saw it, and lots and lots of people saw it, it that's why we're talking about it today. The focus of the article <laughs> um, was the, a, a conference that we hosted here Christian at North Point Community Church pastor, this past theology. Thursday and Friday, the Unconditional Conference. Now, I don't think, I've, I know I've never taken a whole Sunday to, to respond to criticism from outside our organization. In fact, I don't even respond publicly to criticism that comes from outside of our organization. I've taught you oh. for years, you're doing a great work, don't come down like Nehemiah. Well, we're doing a great work, I'm doing a great work. We don't have time to go down, you know, and, and have meaning, meaningless conversations. So I just, I don't respond. But You know, like, uh, when he says this, that he's doing a great work and he's getting backlash, mm-hmm. it, it just says to me, this is not a direction you should have gone in. And, and one of my big criticisms of Andy Stanley has been, he's not thoughtful in what he's doing. He's very, um, if you look at his preaching style, it's very quick. It's very like he makes a point, and then before you have a, an opportunity, th- this is incredibly disrespectful to the audience that you're speaking to. When you make a point really quick, and then you don't even allow them time to digest it, you just move on real quick. And you'll notice he does this mm-hmm. here, but he makes a point, and then he just ro- oh, boop, 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 moves on to the next. Uh, you know, <laughs> like it's almost like he's trying to like get away with something. Right. D- does that make any sense? Yes. Like, and, yeah. and so like, basically I feel like that's kind of like an insult to your audience. It's basically telling your audience that you're, they're stupid. Well, I think he's trying to cover up a fault that he's actually being convicted for. Right. Right. At the moment. Yeah. <laughs> and if you, for me dealing with uh, people that, you know, I'm not a policeman or anything like that, but with dealings that I've had and but you're heard a about church security guard. Right. But they, they right away, they try to give excuses for what they say or what they did. And when they're doing that, they're trying to defend themselves before you even get to the accusing yeah. them. And that's what he's doing. He's like softballing this up to you so that you sit there and go, oh, okay. Yeah, we'll listen to this. I mean, no, he's wrong. He knows he's wrong, but he still keeps doing it. And I feel sorry. I mean, his father in heaven must be rolling over because... This yeah, is really something. Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about because that. Because of his influence, the author of this, this article's influence, because of his influence and how widely this article has circulated in Christendom, and in light of the confusion that this article and others just like it have created for people in our church, because I've heard from you, and I'm, I'm so glad you reached out, um, to, uh, the confusion it's created in our network of churches, and then as we so began to hear... God a lot of pushback from people within the, in his congregation. I think he makes a statement somewhere in here that people are leaving his church, you know, don't blame him. over this, oh, over this, yeah. this particular issue, because we've seen the Andy Stanley statements before, but, uh, uh, it, you know, by the way, I do this because I, I think that these things need to be pointed out for people in the evangelical Christian community. Um, if you're in our listening audience and you're a Christian I think it's important for you to know and see what's going on in the Christian community. If you're a pastor like I am, I think it's important to see what some pastors like this guy are doing. Um, This is the kind of guy I I would never encourage somebody to attend his church. The confusion it's created, and I feel strange saying this, but this is the magnitude and why we're taking a Sunday to talk about it. The, the confusion is created in different parts of the world, especially with missionary organizations and churches who look to us for leadership, and all of a sudden they read these articles accusing us of all kind of stuff. And so, uh, I know I keep pausing this. Again, the audience is stupid. The audience is well, seeing these they're things. Stupid. They're confused. The audience, you're see, look, all you little people out there, you're all confused, and you don't, you don't know. You need me to interpret what's mm-hmm. happening for you. It's really, it's like the opposite of what you see with the Bible. You know, like oh, what, exactly, yeah, like one of the things we believe in in the Bible. It's called the perspicuity of Scripture. It means that like the average person can understand it. It's why we believe in people owning Bibles. And what, like when Jesus spoke, the, 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 the educated people, ironically, were the ones who couldn't understand what he was saying. And it was the, the farmers and the fishermen, you know, and the evil tax collectors that were, they're, you know, still terrible people. That's right. just a joke. That's a joke, <laughs> tax collectors. But, uh, you know, they're, they're the ones who ironically could hear. So it's, it's almost like the flip, you know, and I don't know if you're listening to this right now, please, you know, say something in the comments. If you think I'm, I'm wrong on this, I just... 
the man's style really rubs me the wrong way. I feel like it's very disrespectful to the audience. I, I could not sit through something like this personally because I would personally feel so disrespected as somebody sitting out there while the preacher is vomiting all over me. They like begin this. to lose their confidence. In, not to interrupt, uh, but have you noticed that in our politics that we have today, and I'm not going to mention one side or the other, but they come to us like we're four-year-old kids. Yes, we yeah, don't 100%. Know anything the media is about the same anything, way. And they try to push their garbage down our throat. Yeah. And it's like they want to keep pushing, 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 pushing. And like we said, we're dumb, we're stupid, we're, we don't know what's going on, and they're the only ones that know what's going on, and we should listen to them and follow what they say. Yeah. And this is one of the things I am so sick and tired mm -hmm. of my intelligence being questioned. I mean, some of these people haven't even done half of what I've done in my life, and I know they haven't done anything like you've done with you being a pastor and all the studying you've done and everything else. I mean... To downgrade the American public like this and us to sit here and take it yeah. and keep taking it, it's it, ridiculous. It really makes me question the people that are sitting in his congregation. Like, how can you for, forget about the whole Bible believing Christian thing for a second? Like, how can you be a self respecting individual and sit there and have your pastor call you dumb? Right. With his preaching style. You know, that like I. I personally like it's. It's really hard for me not to get angry and agitated when I sit there and and listen to this kind of thing. And and ironically, with what you just brought up, Don, it, this man is being influenced by that demographic, mm -hmm. by that same demographic. That's exactly. the, that's the criticism that he's facing here, not just with this whole conference, but with a lot of the direction that he's. Uh, and they wonder, hey, what's going on in Atlanta, and what's going on specifically with Andy? So. We decided to address it. But here, here's the tricky part. Um, the way I, I view this, and even though we have influence outside the walls of our church, I'm a local church pastor for, for the way I think about this. And so you, and by you, I mean anybody at any of our local churches or our network of churches, you are my first audience. So yeah. I've made it a habit to never say anything out there that I haven't said in here first. <laughs> and so I feel like I need to respond out there to some of the criticism. But before really? I respond out there, I wanted you to hear it from me first. And that's why we chose not to stream the message online. Now, like he's such a lightning rod. I mean, it's like, an, he, I think I have to imagine that he got such pushback from his own church mm -hmm. on this, that this was absolutely essential. I mean, this is, this is, uh, this is a major damage control move here. You know, that's what this is. This is a major damage control. It's, it's so clear when you when you watch it, you know. One thing I want to ask you is, you know, we've known one another for years. I was a deacon and elder under under you. And we, you and I, have had disagreements. We've talked about the disagreements that we had about the church and different things and this and that. And right away, you were never, ever demeaning to me whatsoever. You always took my advice. You are, you know, I mean, you didn't take it, take it, but I mean, you you listened and you. Uh, well, well, I, like, just, I let together. you run a church. That's why we get along. Yeah, and we work together <laughs> to do this. But the thing of it is, is how many people have approached him and said, you know, this is wrong, and why isn't he listening to them? Why isn't he saying? All right, why do they find what I'm doing wrong? Yeah. And at least look into it. Instead, he pushes on with this garbage constantly. Yeah, right, right. And pretty soon Just he's going to nope. he's going to have a drag queen up there preaching. I, watch I and see. that will be. Yeah, what's what's this 2024 right now? I always get made fun of cuz I say that I'm old, you know? I get funded by people in a in a church cuz they're like, "No, let me show you old." I'm like, "I'm 46." I'm like, "I forget stuff all the time now." But like you know, but I, so 2024, you want to take bets by 2030? You think it'll happen sooner? I think it'll happen sooner with okay. him. <laughs> with him, it might be within the, this year. I know there are a lot of people who came from the outside because we weren't streaming it, and they just can't wait to you know get their claws into us. I get that, and we're so glad that you're here. You, we'd love for you to come every single. It, it, it's like 
we're so influential. My church is so, I'm, I'm just a little church pastor, but my church is so influential and people, people, you know, we're the paparazzi. They can't, they can't wait we to can. get closet on this. You may gain a different perspective on us for sure, but maybe even the Christian faith. So I know we have some people from the outside, but this is, I guess, symbolically my way of saying, I want you to hear this from me first before mm. the outside world Here's it. So back to the article. Damage control. <laughs> um, y'all are very smart people. So all you have to do is, you know, in 30 seconds, you can read between the lines. The author is actually accusing me of departing from his version Whoa. of biblical Christianity. So I want to go on. Re- wait, 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 wait. <laughs> what is, are there different versions of biblical Christianity? According to him, apparently so. <laughs> I didn't realize there was different versions of like you can just make them up i guess i don't i don't know well that's what he's doing this he was being criticized because someone else's i'm sorry like this is unbelievable this is unbelievable this is literally unbelievable that like someone of his influence is saying these kinds of things but you know the sad part about it unbelievable is stuff i've watched on youtube with other uh, blogs that have been done uh, along with Christian uh, talking yeah. about Christianity and that there's a lot of churches now that are bending over backwards for LGBT or homosexual or lesbian. Oh, yeah, they're, they're looking bending, at him as an example, and they're preaching this stuff to hold these people dear. Not that you hate them, it's just that you bend to what they yeah, want, right, right, and you're taking right. the word of God and throwing it in the and trash I, can, right? And I think that's sort of the that, that, that's the that's the fork in the road because it's like, and and maybe it's not really a fork. I don't know, but how do we as Christians minister to that particular demographic? Because when I see what he's doing, and that's what he goes on to explain here, is that, that this is all part of his ministry strategy because he doesn't want to lose them. But what happens when you do what he's doing is you lose all the other ones. Mm-hmm. You, you lose the people who are faithful, who are uh, trying to live. Uh, we're not perfect, but we're trying to live a life uh, of obedience to Jesus Christ that's, that's expressed outwardly, that's not openly you know, thumbing our nose at God. And, and you, you, do you know what I, so I think that's what you do. So I think it's just whatever he's doing, it's not right. It's, it's not oh, working. It's absolutely. creating, you know, you, like, okay, ch- we made church people mad. Well, you know, that doesn't make, mean that something's wrong. Jesus made church people mad. Mm-hmm. So did Paul. But I don't think they did this. No. Th- this, is, this is different level um, what's going on here. Record and really say, is. I have never subscribed to his version of biblical Christianity to begin with. So I'm not his leaving version. anything. Okay. And he, if he were here, he would say... That, that's like a total oxymoron. Like uh, his version of... It's either biblical or it's not. Like, right. yeah, there's different interpretations. Like maybe what he's kind of talking about is... Uh, like Christ, the the uh, idea of Christian orthodoxy, like like there's orthodoxies like the or what sometimes people refer to as the pale of orthodoxy, like that range of where like you can believe these different things and still within this range still consider yourself a Christian, but you don't like biblical his version of biblical like it just sounds so manipulative the what he's like he sounds. I've said before, I don't know if you would agree with me or not, Don, because I I got some pushback on this. I said that I feel like he's effeminate in his mannerisms and stuff like that. That's very possible. So like, but my problem with it is, is that I don't think that he is acting like a real man and leading like a real man. Like when he's talking here, this whole damage control session here, this is like... This, he sounds to me like an adolescent girl who's framing things in some kind of way, like some catty, you know, adolescent female child. Like, and I guess young boys can do this a little bit too, but you would call them effeminate. You well, would, let me ask you this question. Uh, you know, like that's what he sounds like to me. In the Old Testament... When they found out a, that a person was lesbian or homosexual, what did they do with them? Yeah, I know. They stoned them. <laughs> I know, I know. So you mean to tell me 
that if this man has studied the Word of God, and he's studied the Old and the New Testament, I mean, you don't see where well, this he is so He wrong. disconnects the Old Testament from the New. That's his whole, his whole thing is unhitching. And he does it because he thinks the, the Old Testament, in terms of reach, reaching people, is mm-hmm. unhelpful. You know? well, so he basically writes off, not, I don't want to say the first half of the Bible. Let's call it the foundation of the Bible, like the Old right. Testament. That's why even like in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, if, if, if the Gospels, let's say we're, this is our, our apologetic, is that the Gospels are reliable. Well, they, these Gospel authors are quoting the Old Testament mm-hmm. as their authority. That's, that's, why, that's actually the basis for why they're saying they have authority, because they're fulfilling that Old Testament authority, you know. So, but he, he just writes off the whole, he writes off the whole yeah, it's foundation the, of the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. I mean— even though if he writes off the Old Testament, it's still in the New Testament about it, about, you know, yeah. them going against— And it's against, all Scripture. You, you right. know, it's all, it, all of it. And it's so all, what he's doing yeah. is circumventing it, going around it, and not really using what he should just right. to appease a very small group of people. And it isn't—you know, one thing that uh, LGBT and the, and the rest of them need to know is— we love them. Yes. We don't hate them at all. It's just the fact that we're trying to get them right with Jesus yes. Christ. And to know that what they're doing is wrong, it's not right. And you can't do that by ignoring the issue and exactly. pretending like people are stupid. Like even as an, from an apologetic standpoint, the idea of un, let's, let's just ignore the Old Testament because it's hard for people to understand. Like, number one, you're you're assuming that people are stupid and they can't understand it. Like the old Testament is very understandable, Mm -hmm. you know? And, and one of the, I think one of the big things people get wrong today is we're trying to understand the old Testament in light of a modern lens. It should be the reverse. Exactly. It should be. What does the old Testament say? What is not that you validate every element of, of the ancient culture that it came out of, but what are the principles that it's teaching us about life, about sexual purity, about uh, all these different things, you know, uh, what, what a, a functional society looks like that. That's what God was creating for Israel was a functional right. civilization, one that would, would last forever. That was the whole point of it. And so, you know, that's, so you have to, you have to reverse that, not get rid of it. But it, it, again, it just kind of plays to that idea that I constantly get from him that people are dumb. Well, Andy, I've never subscribed to your version of biblical Christianity and that's okay. We can agree to disagree, but this is so extraordinarily misleading. The message, bottom line, that version of Christianity draws lines and Jesus drew circles. Okay. Draws but it, lines. it draws lines. So it draws. So he's basically like, is now is he saying that this is a it is a viable version of Christianity or no? I, I think what he's actually saying here, in my opinion, he's not very clear uh, when he communicates, um, it, which is sad because it's he's funny. really someone that's looked up to as a leader. It's like. He's just saying there's there's different versions of biblical. This version doesn't line up with my version, which implies I think anybody could make up their own version of right. quote biblical Christianity and there's no platform upon which we can critique versions to see if a particular version is better than the other or if one isn't true at all. But then he's now saying that this isn't a valid version of I, th- I think that's what he's saying here right? he I drew mean, circles so listen. large and included so many people in his circle that it consistently made religious leaders nervous okay and his circle was big enough to include sinners Boy, that like so me nice. and i come from a long line of sinners like me is that did you just kind of get a picture of the Pharisees? You know how the Pharisees used to like do all the prayers, the wild, right. like in front of everybody, you know, like <laughs> I'm a, such a sinner, you know, like what or whatever. I don't know all that, you know, that's kind of what I was thinking of right there. But it def- he definitely seems to be, and the thing is, I, I know that I jokingly would say that he's dumb. I, he's a, he's a smart guy. So what it says to me is the things that he does are manipulative. They're done on purpose. He's, He's saying that there's these different versions, but then he's now he's just like smacking down this 
other version as bad and saying that it's bad. So definitely. No Eric Church fans in the crowd. Okay, <clears throat> keep going. Okay. Um, the good news is, now the good news is, this article actually gives me an opportunity to talk about some things. I, again, I am so proud of, but there's just never been an opportunity to talk about it. So today, I'm gonna tell you the backstory you to the current this. story and then talk about our story moving forward. So we gotta go back in time for a few years. In 2014, um, Tom Chef Shunis and Kevin Ragsdale, who oversaw our amazing network of middle school and high school ministries throughout our network, of churches. Uh, I think it was Tom that first came to me. He said, Andy, um, more and more middle school students are coming out to their small group leaders about their same sex attraction. And we had already seen this begin to happen with high school students coming out to their small group leaders. And so Tom and, and Kevin said, hey, Andy, our small group leaders and, and our, you know, our, our volunteers, they just don't feel equipped to talk to a middle school or a high school student about same sex attraction. And would you put together a training to help our leaders, um, you know, know what to do with this? Well, to me, that is an extraordinary win. This is, you know, this is almost 10 years ago. Once upon a time, I don't have to tell you this, once upon a time, the last place a middle school student or a high school student was gonna talk about their same-sex attraction, the last place they were gonna talk about it was where? In church. And now oh. they feel confident and they feel connected to where they can talk about the most sensitive area of their life with their small group leader in church. I'm t- should, should we talk about heterosexual attraction in church? <laughs> I'm just, did I miss something? <laughs> like, I just want to make sure we're being equitable here. Is everybody getting the same rules? <laughs> you know, like, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, I know I pr- particularly, I go to church just to talk about my heterosexual attraction. That's why I go, hey, Don, did you see that? Uh, did you see the, that, that latest movie that came out with the really hot actress. You know the one that I talk about all the time. She's so hot. Oh, my goodness. Like, <laughs> That's real Christian talk. Is that talk. acceptable? Yeah, right. That's real like, Christian talk what? there. <laughs> oh, my. Okay, so, so this is the problem. This is his problem. All right. And then I'm going to actually fast forward here uh, to his solution. Because th- this whole thing, I'll, um, I'll put a link to the audio transcript of this in the comments if you haven't seen this, to his solution for the problem. Because I think this is where he gets himself into some hot water. This is one of the questions I ask him. How do you wish the church had responded when you came out? In other words, what would have made a difference in your life? Because all of them that I had talked to, they all grew, all of them grew up in church. In fact, 80, 86% of LGBTQ plus folks in the United States grew up in church, but they leave church at twice the rate of straight people. So I knew they'd grown up in church, had bad church experience. So I asked him, what would help us help this student, group of students not experience what you did? And- so what he did here was he actually he went to these people within his congregation that are openly homosexual Mm -hmm. people. And he, he interviewed them. He met with them. He talked to them and asked them these questions. And that you experienced in your local church. Um, What can we do to ensure that our same sex attractive students don't have a church experience like yours and lose their faith along the way. And they all responded. And I sat at my kitchen counter and I just wept. Oh, And their insight and Shut input up. was gold. It was so helpful. But Crocodile the reason food. it was so emotional to me, because I already knew some of their stories. The reason it was so emotional was because all of them began this way. I can't believe anyone in the church is even interested in my story. I can't believe a pastor is actually asking me to help with ministry. And I just cried. Can I ask you a question, Don? Because like I say this all the time, and I don't want to be just talking into an echo chamber here. Is is it your experience at all that like um, LGBTQ people are persecuted by the church, like in any way at all? <laughs> like not that I know. In, in my, I've never seen it personally. Mm. That's why I'm I'm just trying to bounce this off to somebody else. Like I and I've I've been a part of like hardcore evangelical churches for thirty years now, and I'm I'm kind of you know looking for that. I feel like people in general who don't like church and don't like church people, usually what I find is they don't because of themselves, you know? Well, the thing of it is they come to church and they listen to the preaching and this is for lesbians, you know, and homosexuals and LBG and they get convicted because of the preaching of God's word. Yeah. So when they get convicted, they don't want to come anymore because they feel so rejected 
by just hearing the truth. It isn't the person that's doing it. It's it's God's word working in their heart. It's the same thing with you and I. If we curse a lot, let's say, for example, and you go to church and all of a sudden the preacher's talking about uh, cursing or blaspheming God through what you say and this and that, you get convicted. It's like, yeah, right. I shouldn't do that. That means I get up and leave the church because he's talking about something I'm doing wrong. Right, right. No, what, what, you I, want that. You should want that as a Christian, right. don't you? Want that? You I want to know. Be right I know with you God. say one of your things is like hit me between the eyes, you know. Right. And, and everybody's not like that, but like, but my thing is, did, did you ever, in, in all the years that you actually listened to me preach sermons on right. Sunday morning, did you ever hear me preach a message or use an example that was against? homosexuality, LGBT issues. No, matter of fact... In the, I don't think I ever did. No, I mean, honestly. So the, I, the pastor that was before <laughs> you never preached about that either. And the thing of it is, too, we even had a ministry in the church for homosexuals yeah, 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 and yeah, lesbians. Right. So it was to help them... To, and so now today, people have a problem with that. They have a problem with the uh, the one back in the day. This is like 20, 30 years ago. It was called Exodus. I think it was an Exodus International, which I think is a larger thing, a larger mm -hmm. organization. He actually, it, in, later on in this this message that he gives here, he really hammers that whole uh, uh, strategy of, tr of trying to, you know, he claims like not make people not gay. Like, I don't think anybody is trying to make people not gay. Like, we're trying to help people live a lifestyle of obedience to right. Jesus. Exactly. Which looks like particular outward behaviors. That's all. We're not trying to say, we don't think you can change certain dispositions completely. You know, I, I don't think. I mean, and I, this side of eternity, right. you know, what we're trying to do is help people recognize their sins no matter what it is. And that's no what, matter what it is. That's and what I want. Live is, a lifestyle of obedience to Jesus, because yeah, that's where true life is found, that, right? That's what I want when I go to church, is I want to hear what God has to say about whatever situation. I mean, it could be about anything. Yeah. But if you're convicted by that, then apparently you're wrong in how you think. And to me, I would either take, I take it to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, you know, show me, teach me more about what I'm doing wrong so that I can start doing it right. Because you're not going to fly through this life and be a hit miss Christian and plan on going to heaven. Right. Yep. You've got it. Yep. You've got it. He says, uh, many but, are yes. called, but few right. are chosen. Yeah. So the bottom line to it is, is all, everybody's called, but are they going to go because of their own way of like cutting Jesus out of their life. Yeah. Our pastor said on Sunday, and he said this many times, 75% of Christians do not read their Bible. So 25% of Christians read them. And like he said, if you're going to have a brain surgery, would you want the brain surgeon to only go through 25% of his schooling and then work on you? No, you want him to go through 100% of what he you know, should learn. So that's the thing of it. We're supposed to be examples to the world. We're supposed to see where we're wrong. We're all born in sin. Flesh is sin. That's what the Bible says. Uh, there's none righteous. No, not one. And we have to understand that we're not righteous. God makes us, or Christ makes us righteous through his death and resurrection. And we need to adhere to what they, God wants. He hasn't changed in how many thousands of years? His word is always true. He doesn't change, flip back and forth. And that's the thing that gets me is this has been true for how many years? Now, why all of a sudden is it wrong? Yeah. And is it wrong because this guy wants it to be wrong? Or the people out there that want to be a man instead of a woman or a woman instead of a man, they want it to be wrong or they want to dress as a woman when they're a man? I mean, I don't know. I really think there's such a strong delusion in this world, not only the United States, but this world, that it's causing these people to feel this way and to go this way when they should get on their knees and say, Lord, something's wrong. Please help me to see what it is so I can be right with you. Yeah. I would question if this strategy is that Andy Stanley and, and many other pastors mm -hmm. use, many other Christians use, is effective at all. And, and I don't think that it is. Uh, 
if you go back, you know, 10 years, I flirted with some of these ideas as a preacher, Mm -hmm. flirted with them, thinking that we need to be nice to this particular community because they've been beat up by the church, thinking Mm -hmm. that in my mind. Right. Because that was the rhetoric at the time. But that was 10 years ago. And where we've seen the culture go since then with that sort of strategy like, I, I don't think I've seen one person using that strategy truly come to a, a, a deeper knowledge of the Lord or a knowledge of the Lord at all. No, because they're pacifying I, I've never themselves. seen it. I'm not saying it as, I'm just saying I've never seen it. Right, but they're pacifying themselves. Yeah. That's what they're doing. Instead of saying, okay, you're, you know, if God's, it, there's a saying that we used to say, if God said it, we believe it. Well, if God's and uh, if if God said it, we believe it, and that's that. The thing of it is, we need to cut that middle out. Right. God said it, and that's that. Yeah. And that's the way it is. And isn't that like the big problem with Christian people? Is for some reason we're taught by the church that that what you just said is a bad outlook. Mm-hmm. It's an oppressive outlook. It's actually. The best possible outlook someone can have right. is that because this is where the problems come in, and, and it shouldn't be used ever as a, as a club to beat someone with, right? No matter what their struggle is. But God said it, and, and honestly, it's not that confusing. The right. confusion comes in when we try, like He's doing in this sermon right here, to twist. And we try to explain and we try to justify ourselves and our own actions. And we create these exactly. big like controversies like he did here. And then he comes out like the adolescent schoolgirl. And he's trying to not only explain it away, but do that with an, an anger and a disingenuous moral outrage. Like everybody who disagrees with him is wrong. Right. You know, that's, that's I took the what they totally had, what that. they gave me, incredible insight, put it together. We did this training. Again, some of you, I, I, I'm sure that some of you were there that night for that. Um, our, our students were appreciative. The leaders were appreciative. And then our student pastors at our different campuses, of course, they're all in networks of student pastors and other churches. They began talking about it. And other churches said, hey, can we have that? Can we use that? We were very hesitant. I mean, this is, you know, uh, about 10 years ago. And, you know, this whole conversation is so delicate, but it's so extremely important. So we just gave it away to pastors, youth pastors that wanted to show it. And then we began to hear about- Basically, his preaching style to me is like, I'm gonna do whatever I wanna do. Like, you don't like it, screw you. I'm gonna keep doing it in your face. Like that's kind of- From youth pastors that said, hey, I, take it. I watched it. I, my small group leaders need this so, so, so much. But if I showed this to my student, to my volunteers, I would lose my job. All right, so we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna pause there. You can see, basically you can see his strategy, right? You can right. see like his, his problem and, and I would say it's definitely his problem. It's not the church's problem. It's his problem. Right. And then you can see his solution to his problem, his strategy for how he's going to combat this. He's going to combat this by uh, getting the, courting the opinions and the approval of openly gay men. Mm-hmm. That's what he's going to do. <laughs> not, not, people, not people who are living a lifestyle of repentance. Right. These are people, I don't know if I said this so far, two of the people he had speak at this conference, they were gay, quote, married men, not married to women. Wow. Yes. And he had them speak at his conference, and he didn't think this was going to cause controversy. He didn't think that, you know, he said there, I don't know if anybody caught this, he said, way back in 2014, that's 10 years ago. He's been doing this for 10 years. I didn't like, realize that either. Like, you could see how far down the road this church is immersed, enculturated. They, mm-hmm. they're, they're lost. Oh, yeah. They are lost. Like, they're, like they're, there's no opportunity for course correction at this point. Like, it's these people, what's wow. Elon Musk call it? The woke mind virus? Like, they're gone. Oh, Mentally, yeah. emotionally gone entrenched those who stay at his church at the i think at this stage 
it's it's safe to say they're gone. They're just spiritually dead, useless for the kingdom. I mean, gone. Well, sure. I mean, we've already, we've been in this space for ten years. Why wouldn't we host the conference? Well. As soon as they begin marketing the conference, all the Christian critics pounced. They were, what they said about Greg and Lynn was cruel. What they said about Debbie Causey and Al was cruel. What they said about you was cruel. You need to flee the church. Andy's a heretic. He's sending people. Yeah, yeah. people need to flee the church. Why are, why are we cruel? Like, isn't it the exact opposite? Isn't, doesn't the devil take what's true and flip it completely on its head. Isn't it cruel to proclaim to be a pastor, to tell people the life-giving message of Jesus, the gospel, but not actually give them the gospel? Isn't that the cruelest, most torturous, most evil and wicked thing that a person can possibly do? And then anybody who thinks differently than you become a dictator, demonize them, I, you know, I feel sorry for him in this fact here. He's going to have to answer for what he's done, like all of us do. But when you put an authority as a pastor or a leader in the Christian church, or you know, when you stand before the Lord, you don't think you're going to answer for this? Right. You don't think Christ is going to get in your face about this? And the thing of it is, is whether he believes he's saved or not, I'm sorry, Maybe I'm judging, but I don't believe the man is saved. Yeah, I, and I totally agree. Th- Jesus is going to say, be you hot or be you cold, but I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And he's right. going to vomit I, I him mean, out. The Bible talks about this stuff. Yes. You know, it talks about, like, Paul talks about the one who dies and goes before the judgment. And if you've built on that foundation with anything that's not of Christ, it's like you, the, the person is saved as through the fire. Yeah. Burned away. Burns like, up. I, and so why does the Bible use this imagery? I mean, you, you can have the largest church in the world. You can be have multi-campuses, be doing all the things that he's doing. But it's like, if you're not actually discipling people to live a lifestyle of obedience to God, you're... You're doing Satan's work. Yes, you're hating them. Yeah. And you you're, are you're hating their... Them on, you're leading them on a path of unrighteousness. And so they can't achieve... Yeah heaven because they're listening to this garbage that's spewing out of his mouth and i feel sorry for him i really do because if he truly believes what he's preaching he's going to answer for that someday yeah i what i see in him is i see somebody who ironically i don't think he's a a very good communicator because one of the big uh, criticisms that i heard of him over this particular message that he gave was that he wasn't clear you know, the, the accusation is that he's, he's affirming. He's just gone woke. He's affirming. And it's like he doesn't ever answer that question. He just demonizes anybody who disagrees with him. But he doesn't actually answer the question to allow, to respect people enough to allow them to decide whether they want to continue to listen to him. Well, that's our culture. You, you know though. what I mean? But that's our culture yeah, right Yeah, ex- exactly. There's there's just a total lack of respect. So you have very he's very poor communication, which which may be intentional. True. It, it may be intentional be in, a, in an attempt to be manipulative. Right. So there's that element of it. But at the same time, just an incredible arrogance. And right. an, an incredible arrogance, um, just a, an incredible disrespect for people. And so, well, he, so sad. So he fits sad. in with the rest of this that's going on in this country, which is there's a handful of people that know what you should do. Yeah. They are the smart ones. We are the stupid ones. But yet we built this country. We've sustained this country. They didn't. We did. And we're the dumb ones. And this is what they're doing. They're pushing, like, you're stupid, you're stupid, you should be following me, you're stupid, you're stupid. So right away, if you believe that garbage, you're going to think, yeah, you know, I'm not too smart, and this person really knows what they're talking about, so I should follow them. And that's not the truth. This country has been built on the sweat and tears of men and women that have gone through one war after another, that have built this country out of nothing. And... We carry on that tradition today, but yet we're stupid? Right. I don't think so. And how many of those examples, you know, we, we look in our, in our country, which has a very proud past, uh, I think, I believe. 
And like, you look at how many examples of great leadership we see oh, in, yeah. in some of the worst moments in our country's history, you see incredible leadership and he's written books on leadership. And I, I remember one of them that I read and like, I ain't reading nothing that I don't want to listen to anything. He has to say, I think he's a terrible leader. I mean, oh, does, yeah. does a leader like find themselves in this particular situation? I personally don't think so. Uh, it seems like the situation that he's in here, I think, is damage control because what he did wasn't thought out. It wasn't thought out in terms of the consequences. It's, it's like, could you not anticipate? Are you shocked? Are you surprised? Could you not anticipate this? Or were you just going to go do what you want to do anyways? And I think it's people to hell. You know, I don't know if you saw some of the stuff. Hopefully not. I look at it all. I never turn away from criticism. It's the only way to learn. And sometimes I go, huh. <laughs> I hope heaven's big. That is the most absurd statement I've ever heard. I we're mean, honest. Different areas of it. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Oh, um, no clapping. It really makes me wonder. Like, these, they, they think he's funny. I feel like he's disrespectful. Yeah, to them too. And and that's the irony. I, I, I'm really struggling, like, listen to these people going, like, I, I could not see Remember, no this. clapping. Yeah. <laughs> I would have, I would have clapped at that. Anyway. Um, so the, and, and, and they came after, they, they, they came after me. And the criticism on that, and again, the criticism toward the conference was so intense. Two of the primary communicators and presenters pulled out. One is a household name in Christendom, one of the most famous authors in the United States. I'd, I would say 20% of you at least have read at least one or two of his books. And he said, I just can't drag my family through this because of the, the online um, criticism. The problem is, or a big part and of the what problem. What does that say to you? Like what, how, how a terrible leadership, terrible. Know. This person obviously meant nothing to him. Exactly. You know, and, and, and then the thing is now publicly, he's like, this person was bad, evil, wrong. But it's like, well, wait, whoa, whoa. Let's take a couple steps back. Like, obviously, this person meant nothing to you. And it really makes me wonder when I see these kind of qualities in a leader. Like, it makes me wonder, like, is this how he would treat me? Is this how he's treating the people in his church? Like, they're just nothing. They're just like a platform for him to stand on. Right. And the moment they're not useful anymore, they're gone. Or worse, they're demonized and they're cast well, out. The critics of the conference, they never took time to discover the actual purpose of the unconditional conference. The oh, story became it, it's Andy fault. Stanley is hosting a gay affirming mm. conference at North Point Community Church. And then because Andy Stanley was uh, producing a gay affirming uh, conference at his Any of you saw bits and pieces and podcasts and articles. And uh, uh, so, of course, since you didn't know anything about the conference, you didn't know anything about our history mm -hmm. in this space. Of course, some of you were confused. Some of you were, and some of you are mad and angry and families have left our church. And Diane, my assistant for 25 years um, is here. She would tell you, anybody that called, texted, voicemail, email, I responded to personally. I just, lie. there were days I met with three families at a time to say, here's what's going on. Here's the backstory. Story. Most of them are like, oh, thank you. I didn't know that. Others of them are like, honestly. You know what? I, I really wonder if he's going to be pastoring in five years. I don't know. He sounds like he's going in circles. Yeah. <laughs> well, he preached on it. <laughs> he wants us running in circles. <laughs> he, he is. He's just like, just Jesus he's, made circles. <laughs> you know. He's something else. But, he, but when you see this, like, it, it seems very chaotic. And I just wonder people can't last like you you can't create this kind of chaos and remain in leader you just can't because it's you're constantly creating too many you know fires that you can't put them all out well and if I, he keeps going in circles like this the people that are in his church are gonna sit there and go huh i mean what's yeah. he doing where's he going you know and like i well, like i said before when i was an elder and we would talk at, or deacon whatever and we would talk about certain situations in our church. It wasn't like you disregarded what I had to say. I mean, we either agreed or disagreed, or we worked together to achieve a certain outcome. But, you know, if, if, I'd, have, if I'd have been in his church and I told him, look, man, you're just, this is wrong, and this is why it's wrong, 
if he continued down this road, I just leave the church. Yeah. I mean, well, that's why the thing stay? is like pastors, any pastor, any leader, any business owner will occasionally do things that the populace, the general populace doesn't have all the backstory on. They, they may seem from outward appearance to be controversial. It, it just goes along with the territory. Right. But the things that he's doing are just so outrageous. Oh, definitely. That it's like, it, it, then to come back and say, you know, like, you're, you all, these people, they don't understand. They were saying these things because they don't understand our church. They don't know. They're dumb. Like, that's, that's the... That, that's he, just a whole nother level. He's insulting you know, that's, everybody. Yeah. That's what he's doing. Andy, I just don't believe you, and, you know, we're out. And it's why I chose to spend an entire Sunday talking about this. So no, the purpose of the Unconditional that. Conference was not to equip parents to convince their gay kids that they weren't gay or shouldn't be gay. That was not the purpose of the conference. Okay, so you see that statement right there. See, he's going against, like, the way ministry was done 30 years ago. That, right. That's what he's slapping down. Right there. Every That's parent who attended the conference had already tried that, right? Christian parents of LGBTQ plus kids go there immediately. They pull out the verses. They argue. They, I mean, that's just, that's just where parents go. They pull out the convince, convict, coerce, control. Convince, convict, coerce, control. Convict, convict, you know, convince, convict, coerce, control. So he's, this is, I guess, his version of biblical, I'm throwing up in my mouth as I say this, his version of biblical Christianity. <laughs> but I guess it's this, he's just basically demonizing like what seems to be biblical accountability. I mean, listen yeah. to that kind of what he's <laughs> No, you're right. So basically if you listen to what he just says, coerce, like convince, coerce or something like that, you know, I mean, Paul like, like argued with people. He refuted, uh, you know, illogical statements mm -hmm. and things like that from the scriptures. He are to try to convince them of Christ, you know, right. it was a, uh, he was doing it, it, it. It's not, that's not coercion when you're doing that. That's no. biblical. And when, and there was, there was also such a thing as church discipline, you know, right? like that was also in, in Paul's churches, there was church discipline and in the early church as well. I mind you, you know, it was, you know, there, there were certain behaviors if you did them and you called yourself Christian, that wasn't, no, you couldn't just do that. You know, you know what I mean? Right. Like, well, has he given any scripture to back up what he's saying? No, he hasn't given anything. He's just Jesus that, spoke in circles, you know, so yeah, that's his whole, you to know. To me, I don't I, see him <laughs> using the Bible at all here to make his point yeah. that, that we're wrong and he's right. Right. I don't no, see it. No, and just Bible. as a parenting strategy no. in general, how and effective is that? I mean, that doesn't work with your kids. That didn't work on you when you... We're a kid. The purpose of the conference wasn't to equip parents to... But didn't, didn't your parents, when you were a bad kid, didn't they discipline you? Definitely. Uh, I mean, and you're from, like, the older generation than I am, right? So I know, like, like we got disciplined when we were wrong. Like, basically, what he's saying here is, like, totally unbiblical, because what he's saying is don't discipline your children. If you right. don't discipline your children... You hate them. Right. You hate your, if you don't discipline your children, you hate them. Yeah, you the literally truth. hate your children. He's right. saying, he's saying, he's setting this example for all these mythological followers that he has, you know, don't discipline your children. Don't discipline, biblical accountability, nope, bad. Debate bad. with let their me, kids. The purpose of the. When you look at our defund the police. Oh, same thing. Totally the it's same exactly thing. Exactly. Totally the same ungodly. Thing. So uh, you get arrested for stealing. Yeah. And even people that have killed people, they they let them out of jail within hours. There's no consequences for and anarchy. Right? It's total. That's yeah. what he's promoting is just open air. Conference. So like, uh, the unconditional yeah, conference was right. to equip parents to connect with their kids and to reconnect with their kids and to stay connected with their kids so they would have influence to keep their kids connected to their faith and keep their kids connected to Jesus. Like, I, this is the most ridiculous thing. It's, it's such a false dichotomy of it's either this or it's that there's apparently in his worldview, there's no middle ground of like discipline with love. 
Because that, like that's the biblical model is like that's the reason that God gives the discipline right. is because He loves. Like we don't discipline our kids because we're trying to. In fact, Paul actually says not to discipline them. How does it say it there in Ephesians? To wrath, to uh, you know, to to make them angry. I can't think of the exact wording he used, but that's the point: is that you're not pushing them to a point of rebellion where they're. But it doesn't mean that you don't discipline. It doesn't mean that you just like you make an idol out of the relationship because at the flip side where, where, you know, Paul says, I became all things to all men. There's right. another side where he says, I wasn't even eaten with the people who said they were sexually immoral and gossips and whatever's and were calling themselves Christians. Like there's a balance in there. Right. You know, and, and it's like what, what people like him have done today. It's this whole movement and it's infecting the church. It's infecting pastors who have lost their bloody minds right. that, you know, we, we, we're making an idol out of the relationship. I'm worshiping the relationship above all else. And I'm going to, by doing that, I'm going to save them. That is not what Paul did. That is not what Jesus did. Jesus called people to account. I mean, a whole lot. Well, let me Holy ask, moly. Let me ask you this. Where is the line of thought here? Because are we appeasing God? Are we appeasing exactly, man? Exactly. No, he's totally appeasing man. Right. Totally. So he's kissing up to him. Yeah. And to do what? I mean, what good is this doing you know in the it, long run? You know what he's like in like modern terminology? He's a spiritual simp. Like a, a simp is a, it's a guy who, like all the young kids use this terminology today, who just does whatever the woman wants him to do, mm -hmm. you know? And there's like, you a know... A wuss. Yes, exactly, exactly. We used to call him a wuss back in it. Yes, so it'd be like it's something like that. But it's the guy who just what his you know girlfriend is so domineering or wife is so domineering, and he can't, he doesn't have the capacity to you know express himself or be himself. And there's you know the like almost get a picture of like a guy with flowers with a girl slapping him across mm -hmm. the face, kind of you know, kind of like just just bleh, you know. That's what his. That's what his Christianity is. And it's like, it, but not just his. I mean, this is, a, this is, this is real today. This is a trend. I mean, this is what a lot of people are doing. They're, they're making an idol out of a relationship. A, and, and ironically, they're alienating a, a whole other group of people. So they're being totally, total hypocrites. Like in order to make an idol out of one thing, you've got to hate something else. Mm -hmm. So basically what he's saying in another audio clip of him, you know, talking about these heroes, how these gay people are heroes and these church people are so wicked. Like, you know, if, if they're the hero heroes, then we're bad. We're the bad ones that he doesn't care about. So it's just, just a total, it's not a consistent, you know, Christian. So the 10 presenters are there a few more of that, I think than that, but the 10 plus presenters that the McDonald's invited to speak at their conference, they chose the presenters based on that purpose this wasn't a debate this the wasn't McDonald's one side's going to present the the fast food chain he's talking about the people who put the conference on from his church their last name other McDonald's. side it wasn't wasn't that at all they had health care professionals marriage counselors mental health professionals some pastors they invited me to speak i said i don't want to speak but if you want to interview me i'd be happy to be a part of this i'm so proud of our church for hosting this the presenters these we were know. presenters the mcdonald's knew this is so important the presenters they chose were presenters that Greg and Lynn knew from their personal experience would be okay. most helpful for these parents. And they should know because they are one of those parents. And this is why uh -huh. Justin and Brian were invited, the two married gay men at the center of all the controversy. Whoa. And I'm sure that you've read all about okay, that. So and here's the thing what we were about Brian and, and Justin. <laughs> okay. Their stories and their journeys of growing up in church and maintaining their faith in Christ and their commitment to follow Christ all through their high school and college and what? singles and all up to the time that they were married. Their story is right. so powerful oh, for God, parents me. of gay, especially kids, what? that it's a story gay parents with gay kids need oh, oh, to hear. Oh, it is virtually oh, impossible, and you know this if you stop to think room. about it. It is virtually impossible for a straight heterosexual parent to understand what's going on in the heart and mind of their same-sex attracted child when oftentimes their own child can't or won't verbalize it. 
And this these is, two guys oh have an incredible way of helping parents understand what's going on in the mind and the heart specifically of their gay kids. They do an incredible job helping Christian parents understand because, understand because they have been where those parents' children. Oh, so the Christian parents are dumb. Reoccurring theme here. <laughs> <laughs> the Christian parents are so stupid. They're so dumb. They don't, they don't know. They don't mm-hmm. know how to, what, sin? Oh, I don't know. I never had sin. I don't, my kid is having sin. I don't know what to do with sin. I don't know. Like, how, like they're so dumb that they need, like, a couple of apex, unrepentant sinners <laughs> to come in <laughs> and disciple them. <laughs> to do What? What are they going to tell them? Are, I mean, seriously. I know. What are they going to say? Like, are they, I mean, normally you bring up a success story, right? Like, will they, will their kids get married, like have a gay wedding one day? I mean, is that the goal? Apparently so. I don't know. I, I'm trying to figure out like what, like what do you, like there, here's the thing. There's a lot of people out there who have defeated this struggle, a lot of them. There's preachers that have defeated this struggle. Mm-hmm. I've seen them on YouTube. And oh, yeah. why wouldn't you get one of those people? <laughs> like, wouldn't you want? I, like, I am lost. And, and just, it, it shows you, it really shows you how far left. I mean, the, the, just the liberal, the uh, unbiblical um, affirming, whatever you want to call it, it's all true. It's all true. Because, like, he just called it marriage, too. He didn't qualify. I, at least I do air quotes because it ain't marriage. No. It's not. It's not marriage. It's a live-in boyfriend. It's a live-in girlfriend. It's, right. you know, it's sin. It's whatever you can call it. Same thing if it's, if it's you know, if it's a live-in girlfriend, heterosexual. It's still sin. I'm just saying it's not. But that ain't marriage. It's right. not marriage. He's I mean, well, just that's not what God clear. deemed. Man, it's supposed to be man with a uh, woman, not man with man or woman with woman. Yeah. Remember, it wasn't Adam and Steve. It's Adam and Eve. <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. <laughs> you know, but uh, it's, it's just crystal clear, right? Crystal clear. I, I mean, it's, it was crystal clear. I mean, what I'm saying is his stance, because, like, he doesn't come out. This is the disingenuous part, the part that's disrespectful to his audience, poor leadership, bad communication, like it's basically like giving up a middle finger to your audience, right. and and what those people are doing, those these guys, he, he frames them there as heroes. Did you hear what he said? Yeah, he said they're living like I'm paraphrasing what he said now because I can't remember his wording that he used. Like they're basically these guys are living the his these guys are living the the his, the historic Christ, the victorious Christian life, and so I, there are examples. All all these church people they suffered through. All right. They suffered through all of these terrible church people. The church, I hate the church. I hate it. I hate you, church members. I hate you, Christians. You evil people. You are so mean. You are so rude to anybody who's not like you. These people are the heroes. But I love you, church. I love, oh, I love my church. You know what? Take your duplicity, Stanley, and just. Put it somewhere, buddy. I'm a Christian, so I try to be nice, all right? But just get rid of it. Get rid of it. I actually have limits on what I'll do and I won't do. It, I, I, just, I mean, this guy's openly calling, you know, evil did, good I, and good evil. I don't know what to say, you know? I don't, I don't get this guy at all. I mean— I think I, some of the prophets in the Old Testament would have slapped him across the face. I mean, that's really what I think. Can you imagine— Honestly. If he was doing this in Jesus' day— when Jesus walked this earth, what he would say to him? Oh, my gosh. I mean, he would la- give him a tongue lashing like yeah. he's never had before. Yeah. Because he's totally, and I mean totally, against God. He might be sitting in a, a building that he calls a church, but apparently it is not a church. And the people that are sitting there listening to this garbage without getting up and leaving, they're supposed to be part of the church or the church. And apparently they're not because they're not taking in God's word. We're living stones of the church. And if you're a living stone, you have to know what it's all about, what it's put on. I mean, 
Amen. I, I you're, you're speechless, just like me. That's where I'm I, at. I'm I kind of it. like, I've got nothing left to say. I just can't, you know, it's like, what on earth are like we? To, is this like a parallel universe? And shake him. Yes, and I know. Say, what I, and he needs it. I mean, he, you know, here's the thing. I don't know if this is going to get me, you know, get this uh, video banned or something. <laughs> it's going to disappear off of YouTube. But like, <laughs> but like, you know, Elijah, like he mocked mm -hmm. the prophets of Baal, publicly mocked them. Like, like people. You know, sometimes they'll say they, they don't like the way I approach something like this. It's like, it's like, you, you, have you read your Bible? Have you seen what these guys did? Like, he openly, publicly mocked them. But then he put them to death. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, do you understand how bad it is to misrepresent Jesus? Like, I, I'm just being honest. Like, do you, do you understand? This is not, leadership is not something that in the Bible you're just supposed to just go off and run and, you know, shoot from the hip. That's, that's not what it is. I mean, you, you, could, you're, you could incur a much uh, worse judgment than the average person. I pray that that's not the case for Andy Stanley here. Don, thank you for joining me today, man. It was oh, a lot of fun. My uh, it's, been a, it's been a minute. It has. Appreciate you and, uh, you know, what you mean to this ministry. Don's, you know, obviously been a part of my life for some time. I always appreciate your perspective. You think I'm still on straight and narrow? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I bring them on every now and then just to make sure, to affirm, well, affirm that I'm going the right way. You finally <laughs> took me out of the chains <laughs> okay. that I was chained in from. That's the truth. <laughs> that's how a real man would handle it. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, hey, that's all I got, guys. Uh, say hi to your wife, Don. I definitely will. No, happy anniversary. Today's your yeah, anniversary, you. right? Yeah. How many years? 36 yeah, you're, today. You're really old. I, I, I just her, say that I'm old. I asked her again today, would you marry me? Did you? Yeah. And Aww. she said, yes. And yeah. I said, well, happy anniversary. She goes, what? Well, don't don't turn simp, man. All no, right. But the thing of it is, <laughs> I knew it was our anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> she <laughs> didn't. I did. <laughs> All right. Well, that's all we got today, guys. And uh, hey, like I said before, this is, you know, really a, a sad, sad thing. I, I hate seeing stuff like this in the church. I actually, uh, I, don't, I don't like making these kinds of videos, but there's a reason that I do it. I think these kind of things need pointed out. Um, we need to shed light on them. I, I'm actually, I can't believe I didn't uh, hear about this sooner, this, this situation with Andy Stanley, the stuff that he was saying. And uh, I, I really do think these are the kind of things we need to push back against uh, if we're going to be true disciples of Jesus, if we're going to be disciples that make disciples, if we're going to be pastors that are worth our weight and uh, pastors that are pulling our weight in the kingdom. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, love y'all. If you haven't done so already, make sure you like, subscribe, share, do all the usual stuff. Uh, look me up on social media. If you haven't done so already, I'd love to get a message from you at Pastor AJ Platt. And that's all we got, friends. I will see you maybe with Don, maybe not. I don't know. In the next video. Peace.